This week, I took my time machine back to the early 1800s, and I found a very bad lady. While the United States wrestled with its own soul on the issue of slavery, even going so far as to federally ban the import of slaves in 1807, the demand for free plantation labor continued to soar across the antebellum South, and many were intent on acquiring it by any means necessary, even by kidnapping free blacks from cities in the North and smuggling them to places like Louisiana and Alabama, where they were often never heard from again. Hop aboard and my guest and I will take you to meet a woman named Patty Cannon, one of the main conductors on the reverse Underground Railroad. Trust me, Harriet Tubman, she ain't on today's episode of Vintage Villains. Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm Allison Dixon, and if you've been following the episodes in any order, you'll be fresh off the coverage my guest and friend Jason Blair and I did on one of the bigger heavy hitters in vintage villain history, John Wilkes Booth. And during that series, which naturally led to discussions of slavery, he brought my attention to someone a little lesser known in mainstream discussions of American history, but who is every bit as loathsome, if not more so. And today, the two of us are joining forces once again to tell you all about her. Patty Cannon and her gang of human smuggling and murdering outlaws spent more than 20 years roving the Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia countryside, kidnapping an estimated 10,000 free Black citizens and selling them to plantations across the South and murdering the ones they couldn't sell. But before we get there, we need to do that vintage villains opening ritual and take a short trip on the zeitgeist Zeppelin so you can get a snapshot of what things were like at the time Patty and her gang were terrorizing people. But because the events of today's episode span over more than a decade, I wanted to focus on a year that would do the most heavy lifting in terms of creating an underground market for slave trading. And that would be the year 1808 when a law passed by the U.S. Congress the previous year banning the import of slaves went into effect on January 1st. It was literally called the Act Prohibiting Importation of Slaves, and Thomas Jefferson had called for its enactment during his 1806 State of the Union address. Since the late 1700s, a trend toward the total abolition of slavery really began to pick up steam, Lest anyone think slavery was just widely accepted as a given in this time, all of the original 13 colonies had already instituted some kind of ban by the time the federal law came around. Though a couple of them, looking at you, South Carolina, had reversed that decision and were still bringing in boatloads of people from Africa. And I should note, the federal law did not prohibit the trade of domestic slaves, and that's where we start running into trouble that you'll be hearing about today. In March the same year, the United Kingdom had also banned slavery throughout its colonies, and they sent its Royal Navy to the west coast of Africa to enforce an abolitionist blockade there. So the tides were greatly turning against the practice the world over, but that did not mean everything was suddenly hunky-dory for those who'd been stolen, bought, and sold. Oh, God, no. More on that in a few. Elsewhere in the world, though, humanity was at peak pugnacity. And if you're into colonialism and imperial ways of life, you're in luck. The English were still holding a grudge over their ass-kicking in the American Revolution, and they were finding all sorts of ways to undermine our newly won independence— We'd be duking it out with them again in just a few years with the War of 1812, and this would become even more of a certainty with the election of James Madison, Thomas Jefferson's main constitutional bro, as president that November. This is also the year Portugal set up its colony in Brazil in order to escape the French, who'd taken their land. And speaking of France, Napoleon Bonaparte was also a very busy man. The phrase Napoleonic Wars is especially applicable to this time period. 
forcing King Ferdinand of Spain to abdicate the, fr the throne so Napoleon could give it to his brother, Joseph Bonaparte. This would effectively end a war that had been going on between Spain and England because they would then need to join forces against Napoleon in what would be known as the Peninsula War. Meanwhile, Russia is at war with Finland. Denmark is at war with Sweden. Honestly, Europe was just this big old tangled cat's cradle of embattled kings at this time. But when you consider just how much money and resources these countries were rolling in when they started colonizing across the globe, the stakes became even higher to grow their empires and hold on to them. And that almost always, of course, means war. In other highly consequential discoveries, though, chemist Humphrey Davy became the first to isolate several elements we now take for granted, like sodium and potassium, as well as strontium, boron, and others, making himself the founding father of electrochemistry. In Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania, anthracite coal was first burned as fuel by businessman and land over and landowner Jesse Fell, thus beginning the use of coal as the key source of fuel for America's coming industrial revolution, RIP Planet Earth. And legendary composer Ludwig von Beethoven put on a marathon benefit concert in Vienna, where he gave the first public performances of what would become the key works by him, including Symphony No. 5. Dun, 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 dun. That's all the singing I'm doing today. Symphony number no. six, piano concerto number no. four, and choral fantasy. And no, I am not singing those either. And a symphony is probably the best way to describe this period of time that Jason and I will be discussing today. Not because it was pretty, in fact, far from it for a lot of people, but because there was so much going on. And in fact, it's playing a bit like the rehearsal for a much bigger piece. Much like you heard in my recent Belgunis episode where you saw what was happening in the world exactly a century later in 1908, we're in another similar prelude period here. In 1908, it was the brief respite before World War I. Here, it won't be long before the people of this time witness the rocket's red glare and the bombs bursting in air we all sing about at our sporting events. And that war will have a direct impact on the topic we're discussing today. So I hope you are all ready for some thick and fascinating American history. Jason Blair of the Silver Linings Handbook, my friend, is here again, as promised, and he brought with him reams of knowledge on Patty Cannon, her stomping grounds, and so much more during this tumultuous period where we would soon discover as a nation what we were truly made of. If you're watching this on YouTube, he even put together some visual aids for you to check out later. So pop on to either the Silver Linings Handbook or Vintage Villains YouTube channels and check it out if you like. And if you're a Patreon member, hello, you're watching this live as we record it as we speak. So I cannot thank you all enough for your support and for joining tonight. And that's it. Let's jump into the Patty Cannon canon and get this show on the road. All righty. All right. All right. Where shall we start? Jason, I would love to start with you because, okay. I mean, you uh, co-hosted on my uh, John Wilkes Booth episodes mm -hmm. and such a fantastic wealth of knowledge that, that you have just in the area that you were born and raised and have lived most of your life uh, where so many of these events took place. And you mentioned Patty Cannon to me in that first episode. I'd never heard of her. And when you told me, what she had done, I was blown away. But I'm curious, sort of your background and what brought you to the knowledge. I've always been a history buff. Grew up in Maryland, right? Or grew up partially in Maryland, Texas, Georgia, Virginia, a bunch of places. But <clears throat> two of them being key, Maryland and Virginia here. And really, I have always been a history buff. I've been fascinated by history. I've been interested in it. My mom used to joke that, um, that, uh, the reason why I got C's in my history classes was I was like 30 years ahead of wherever the history <laughs> class was. I didn't always get C's, but she did make that comment because I was constantly reading it and reading history books and fascinated, I think, in the idea of, I think, something very early on in life, you know, being able to see how we repeat our mistakes over and over again. Yeah, really left me very interested in one sort of like what what mistakes exist in history 
that we're poised to repeat either because we don't know history or we're not able to translate it into the present. So, you know, with that being somebody who grew up in Maryland, which a lot of people don't think of as a part of the South, but very much is, um, growing up in Maryland, growing up in Texas, growing up in Georgia, <clears throat> Civil War history and education around these things were always a sort of deep topic. And we've talked about the idea of you growing up in the Midwest probably didn't get as much um, Civil War stuff as, right. as we did. So it was always a fascination. And now Patty Cannon in particular, <clears throat> I had, you know, when I was younger, I had heard nursery rhymes and other stories about her. And I was really, as a local, as somebody who grew up in Maryland, went to the University of Maryland for college, kind of did a circle around the South and came back. I was really interested in the intersection between, you know, the North and the South. And, you know, I know when I went off to college, I remember going on this reported reporting trip with Heidi Sherman, one of my college classmates who's Jewish. And we traveled out to the Eastern shore of Maryland. Um, And we traveled out there because we were working on a story about the Chesapeake Bay and one of the islands there. But as you move South on the Delmarva, peninsula like things like the number of confederate flags you start to see like rise and it feels yeah. very southern and we went into this one grocery store and it, it not grocery store excuse me it was a convenience store for a gas station and it was just filled with confederate memorabilia confederate shot glasses confederate flags confederate whatever it was the most awkward moment probably uh, for the two of us as a jew and a black guy but we got <laughs> yeah. our gas we got out of there and i bought a confederate flag shot glass Uh Um, (laughs) that's a power move my friend i I just felt like it should be awkward for them (laughs) so i um so you know the first place in my life that i really in 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 the north ever saw sort of like that confederate presence and you know maryland my father grew up in the south in south carolina in the deep south pre-civil rights movement during the civil rights movement. First place he ever saw uh, the Ku Klux Klan was in Maryland. So I think a lot of people with our modern liberal Maryland have misconceptions about it. And then, so in the 90s, when I was in college, there was a show called Homicide Life on the Streets, which I've been rewatching recently. And it's about um, these, David Simon, uh, the Love creator him. Of the, yeah, the creator of The Wire. Well, he yes. was a former Baltimore Sun reporter. And actually, he was the editor of the University of Maryland student newspaper, The Dimeback, a couple years before I was the editor. But David, um, you know, created Homicide Life on the Street. And they had this one episode that I saw while I was in college, which was about, it was called a woman named Patty Reinhauer. And basically, mm. skipping through, it's a great episode. <clears throat> But skipping through the episode, they find this white guy chained and whipped to death in the basement of a Baltimore row house. And they're trying to solve the murder, and they come across this. They find out that his family descended from this woman named Patty Reinhauer. Patty Reinhauer was a stand in for Patty Cannon. Oh. And so that's how I was really exposed to this idea of Patty Cannon this fugitive slave hunter who was running around Maryland capturing people. And the whole idea in this was one of the descendants of a slave that she of some, she had sold into slavery, came back and, you know. Right. I'm sure there's a lot of ghost stories sort of surrounding her. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. But then when I opened yeah. the book on it, like, forget it. Like, it, this is going to sound crazy, but like, illegal slave trading was like some of the polite stuff she did she was clear i mean and we'll talk about this but she was a straight up serial killer right yeah she not only captured runaway slaves she also captured free blacks in cities like philadelphia both blacks who were born into freedom or who had earned their freedom and took them back down to places like mississippi alabama south carolina um you know to meet the demand that was created by the fact that you could no longer import slaves. You know, so if you think about historically kind of where we were at at that moment that you were talking about in the beginning, once the importation of slaves uh, stops, 
at a time where agriculture and the needs of plantations are growing. Yep. Yeah. Yep, we don't have the cotton gin yet. We're not able to sort of like, it's still being done by hand. It, it's going up. So what slave owners have to do is your slaves can no longer be as disposable. Right. You right. can't throw them away or put them into retirement and, you know, teach them to cook or do whatever um, or laundry. You have to keep them in the field. So that's one aspect of what's happening there. And slavery is becoming more brutal in that sense in terms yeah. of the age piece of it. But you can't afford to lose your lose your slaves. Your threats to losing your slaves are death another slave plantation owner stealing them or someone stealing them. And um, so weird to talk about like stealing people. That's right. This, when, when we talk about this, I yeah. find, you know, because I was, a lot of people know I've been rewatching narcos and I have this obsession with the drug trade or the, the cartels and whatnot. And so talking about people Same thing. talk about cocaine or talk about, you know, some other product that is uh, being traded and realizing that these are human beings that were ripped from their own families. Right. But um, they were products. Country and brought, you know, yeah. But, but for a good segment, you know, they were products, right? They were mm -hmm. property. Um, you know, even though it was against law, you were unlikely to be punished for, um, for, uh, selling a free black person into slavery but what you would be punished for is stealing a slave from a white plantation owner well, yeah, that's where you, because you're taking their property right right so anyway back to that thing the 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 big thing that's happening during that time essentially is it puts without the ability to import in slaves it puts a greater focus on keeping slaves from running away to the north and finding other ways. So the Fugitive Slave Act, which was passed, I think it's 17, uh, I'm going to get it wrong. It's like 1790. Well, there are two of them. But yeah, the first the Fugitive Slave 90s. Act. Yeah, yeah, it's 1793, I think. So the Fugitive Slave Act is passed then. That is designed to implement, for the, all of you who are originalists and want to go by the actual words of the Constitution, in Article 4, Section 2, Clause 3 of the Constitution, it required the return of escaped slaves to their owners. Man. Clarence. Um, but, <laughs> so, <laughs> I got to get a Clarence Thomas shot. Yeah, in. yeah, yeah. Um, anytime. <laughs> so the idea there is the Fugitive <clears throat> Slave Act enables that element of the Constitution, and it allows people to not only hunt slaves, but later in its iterations, demands, puts a duty on law enforcement and government and others to capture fugitive slaves and return them back to the South. And this was just a supply and demand problem. But what was happening in the black market, right? In the black market, free blacks were being captured. And there's that great movie, Stolen, that came out, was that a couple of years ago? It talks about the free blacks who were captured yeah. and, and sold into slavery. So that increases. <clears throat> and so Patty is a part of this um, licit and open uh, hunting of runaway slaves, this illicit capturing of blacks. But what really makes Patty special is she was also killing slave traders. Yeah, she wanted their money, right? Well, that was the main slaves. motive. And, and the slaves, slaves. She, it's and sort slaves. of like when somebody yeah. uh, robs a trap house to get the mm -hmm. drugs that they then turn around and sell. She was in that right. same trade. And and you and I were talking about this last night when we were just going over notes and everything is that this is a whole, this is that specific class of criminal, the kind of criminal that is up for the ultimate danger level. They're going after anybody Absolutely. and everybody to get what they want. And they're brute. They tend to be much more brutal and cruel and impulsive. And a lot of those other things that I think, describe patty and a lot of the accounts of her um, well and and you're right right mm -hmm. like high risk taker willingness to take risks she was very charming and charismatic highly manipulative like straight mm -hmm. out of the psychopath handbook but what she also was was very explosive because as we walk through the story we're going to find out she kills a lot of people she didn't need to kill she didn't need to kill them yeah. for money um, there are some people who believe that she killed one of her own daughters. 
She killed yeah. a number of children for crying. So some some element of this, her desire or her lust for um, lust for death, goes well beyond financial. Uh, for financial sure. Moves. And so, it's interesting because she uh, she let one of her daughters at least live to adulthood because it's really when she starts doing uh, gang work, uh, like get, getting her gang together, the Cannon Johnson gang, wasn't the Johnson part of the gang uh, that that refers to her son-in-law and uh, that she had done a lot of that second stuff son, Second son-in-law. Yeah, it was her yeah. second son-in-law. And I, I think you're kind of leaning in a big point. Patty was not the only one doing this. Yeah. Um, in the history, do you have, I'll go ahead and throw up sort of oh, like yeah. this visual. Visual you, aids, everybody. <laughs> right, right. So this is the, these are the most prominent paths to the Underground Railroad. And the Underground Railroad had actually, in reality, was not an Underground Railroad. It was just the name of it. But it really started in the 1700s. And in that initial route, it was mm -hmm. from the South to Florida, essentially to Spain, to uh, create avenues for escape. Once Florida, uh, you know, becomes no longer friendly to slaves traveling through it, all the routes start to move north for the Underground Railroad. And for it would, it's most prominent, even though it existed in the 1700s, it, it most prominent between 1810 and 1865, toward the tail end, famous people like Harriet Tubman are a part of it and other things along that line. But little sort of talked about is this reverse underground railroad that exists. Yes. yes. And on this map, we're just really highlighting the main routes that Patty took. Mm -hmm. And it's really what's really instructive about it is she's operating in the border state territory and has some unique advantages based on where she is. Yes. So, you know, for those of us who are on YouTube, you can see this. And for those of you who aren't, you can go grab a map of uh, Maryland, Delaware, and Virginia and take a look at it. But on the highlighted counties that you see on there are the Del what's known as the Delmarva Peninsula. So it's a peninsula that's essentially between, on one side, the Atlantic Ocean and the Delaware River up north, and the other side, the Chesapeake Bay and the Potomac River. You could argue tail end, but it's really the Chesapeake Bay. <clears throat> and so the blue counties to the uh, to the west are the Maryland counties. The green counties are the Delaware counties. And the orange counties to the south are two counties in Virginia. Where Patty operated was essentially on the border of three counties. Two in Maryland, one in Delaware. And one of the things that her particular gang used was being able to hop from county to county to county. And But one thing I want to flag for you, Allison, you mentioned her son-in-law, Joe Johnson. Yes. <clears throat> and this is generally where they operated, right? So the Mason-Dixon line is at the top of Maryland. A lot of people don't know the Mason-Dixon line turns down and separates Maryland and Delaware, then goes out. Um, yeah. But you mentioned Joe, but it wasn't really Joe where, you know, a lot of sort of historians have debated, do we overemphasize Patty because of her gender and the fact that that seems strange or different? Was it really Joe Johnson, her, uh, her son-in-law, who was leading it? But in reality, Patty was uh, robbing people and capturing slaves before Joe Johnson ever ma married her daughter. She was doing it with his previous husband before his untimely death. Yes. Um, oh, yeah. <clears throat> her, his untimely death, wasn't that a possible poisoning? There was some, yeah, some yeah. speculation that she might have killed her first husband. Yeah. yeah, well, there's her first husband. Then there's yeah. her daughter's first husband. Oh, her daughter's that's first husband. Right. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Okay. There's lots of death in this story. <laughs> Love. So, Quite a bit. Yeah, a lot of death. A lot of death in the story. So it's just one of the things you have to keep in mind, too, about Maryland and Delaware is, you know, Maryland was a slave state. Delaware was a slave state, but it had started to fall out of favor, right? And But this border that we're used to, or at least that I'm used to, between Delaware and Maryland, even though it looks like a straight line, there was enormous debate during the time. 
Going back to Charles Calvert, Lord Baltimore, and William Penn, who was in charge of the colonial colony, the the border of Maryland and Delaware was ambiguous. There's one instance in the late 1790s where a sheriff from Dorset County, Maryland, crosses over into what other people said was Delaware to collect some taxes, starts to shoot out, he gets killed. It So they totally, this group of people, these slave traders, including Patty, Patty Cannon, took advantage of the border that, lines. That mushy being able border. To get, <laughs> like Israel Keys, right? Like yeah. you kill a person in one state, kidnap them in one state, kill them in the other, bury them in the other, right? right. Same thing. Every time people would sort of come on to them, they would just hop the border um, and travel. And this is well before we had any sort of federal law enforcement apparatus. So uh, these things going on in early America that sort of, you know, when the borders aren't fully set and and there's still that that whole thing being worked out, I imagine just had to be a bit of a nightmare from a jurisdictional perspective and a law enforcement perspective, because, well, was there any real... (laughs) I mean, there were sheriffs and there were local police, but I mean, nobody directly enforcing. Oh, no, there was law enforcement, but there was. Yeah, there was. I mean, well, they were there to catch. Go ahead. The runaway slaves. Yeah, that's what they did. Yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. And and so uh, in order for people to, in in case we hear people that say we're going to politicize the police and all that, we're not here to do that. But we can't ignore the early history of what police were designed to do in this country. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's it's such a complicated thing to even talk about because we already know slavery is abhorrent. They knew it was abhorrent uh, back then. That's where they're trying to abolish this stuff. And it's just... um, interesting to see sort of the the people that that i'm sort of losing i'm losing track of my thought here i mm-hmm. love being live this is awesome yeah, no <laughs> it's the same thing we just cut it out no i mean well yeah we'll cut it out this is why you guys get to sit and watch the raw you know and they whatever love, comes out later this will I love be, this part this will all be cut out but i mean it, it's just uh we, well, can't, think, we can't let that stuff go, you yeah, know, well, and I think history. We're getting at the point. This is one thing you'll get constant debate about this. And I caution people when they take the perspective that, oh, it was just their way of life yes, or, yes. Mm-hmm. you know, it was a different time in history and we've progressed so much. Like do your history. If you yeah. go back to the 1780s, 1790s, 1800s, there are a ton of people who are super progressive on slavery, more progressive than Lincoln was, more progressive than we mm-hmm. are on it. And, the, I mean, the on, Quakers. On, on, yes, the Quakers Shout is an example. The Quakers. <laughs> but even as we'll see in this story, lots of, there's some people in the Deep South who are very much against it. And I so wanted I was to, get, oh, oh, I'm but I would, mention real quick too, yeah. um, Thomas uh, in the chat, he uh, mentioned before um 12 years a slave um, was as another example of uh, this practice um, in mm-hmm. action. I think you said it. I don't think that's specifically based on a, a, a specific person, but of that experience. Yes. If you want to get an yeah. idea of what that was uh, like, that's another movie. And also, yeah, he, he mentioned, yeah, the roots of current police harken back to slavery. Absolutely. I didn't want to leave those, uh, those things going I mean, I saw yeah. that in, my, in the corner of my eye. Um but uh, but yes, there were a lot of progressive people at work. And on the Facebook uh, page, the Vintage Villain Soiree, I posted a, a screen grab of something published in 1805. It was basically a pamphlet that talked about uh, the horrors that we were doing to the slaves that we were bringing over here. They were very aware of what was mm-hmm. going on and the wrong and how wrong it, it was. So I think it's really important to establish that because there are way too many people today who are trying to put a smile on slavery and say, oh, we we trained them and gave them jobs. And uh, no, we didn't fight the Civil War over that. They're really trying to erase those things. And we have to be delicate when we talk about some of this stuff. Yes, there is nuance. But let's not lose sight of the fact that we're talking about human beings being Shadow of slavery. <laughs> Much nuance there. Yeah, yeah. Right? And, and yeah, um, Lincoln, definitely not as progressive as we think he was. I mean, in the sense that <laughs> Uh, You know, we talked about this, Jason, in the uh, Lincoln, in the John Wilkes Booth episode, you know, where he suspends habeas corpus and he's doing all these things. 
during the war that um, would reinforce the idea that he was a tyrant uh, to the people that were fighting him. Um, but yeah, uh, but Lincoln was trying to do the right thing ultimately, I, I believe. So but there were also many people before. So let me give yes. you, let me scene set for you, maybe. Yeah. So <clears throat> we're talking about the Del Delmarva Peninsula, right? So it's a combination mm -hmm. of the vast majority of Delaware, the eastern shore of Maryland, and then the eastern shore of Virginia. Yeah. So it's about 170 miles long, about 70 miles wide at its center, 12 miles wide at its shortest part. I mentioned it's bordered by the Chesapeake Bay on one side, then the Delaware River Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. So you're essentially, you've got big waterways around you. You've got the Potomac River near you. You've got the Chesapeake Bay, which leads out into the Atlantic and then straight on the Atlantic. And you have the ability to cross the bay into a slave state of Maryland. You also have easy access to Pennsylvania and northern cities. So it's a great location to sort of spirit off people and hide them because Delmarva is still today and was then very different than the rest of, let's say, Maryland. Highly yeah. rural, very agricultural, different culturally, very Catholic by background, um, you know, it, you can still go there and see churches from the 17th century, that Catholic churches that are still operating. If you, um, you know, look at its history of even before then, you had the natives who lived along those islands who were pushed out very early eliminated yeah. very, 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 very early. I mean, we betrayed the Native Americans in terms of, or the Natives. I don't even want to call them Native Americans. That's not really fair. Um, but we <laughs> betrayed the Natives immensely in those areas, uh, creating treaties, pushing them out, all right. for this agricultural operation. Um, and so you're in, and I think it's hard to imagine this, a highly rural highly agricultural, great spot for transportation that's yeah. also lawless because of its border. It's like a criminal's heaven, right? It, it really like, is. A, um, and they would, uh, they wouldn't have to go too far south. Like they would be able to kidnap these people, put them on a, on a boat. Would they float them all the way down or would they meet people along the way? I mean, what was the chain of custody looking like in terms of well, so it was, it was different, but uh, once Joe Johnson became a part of it, they would actually sell them themselves. He would okay. literally go on trips, sell them along the way himself, not hand them off to other traders. And that was just really a profit margin thing. And the gang was big enough that at, at different points, 30 to 50 people, that's a group of people going down to sell slaves wasn't going to stop their ability to operate um, up north. So. You know, Patty walking into all of this, like there are two different versions of the Patty Cannon background story. One is she was a local Delmarva girl who grew up there. There's another version of it that I think there's probably a little bit more historical evidence for that somewhere between 1759, 1769, actually in Canada, mm. um, near Montreal, she's born and her family. Um, the story behind her family getting here is that actually her father, L.P. Hanley, was actually um, from a wealthy family in England. He married somebody that uh, they didn't want uh, or his father didn't want him to marry, disowned him. He goes to Canada. And as the story goes, their family gets involved in smuggling along what they call the North Country, which is northern Vermont, northern New Hampshire, and then the Mon Montreal area. Um, long story short, Mr. Hamley, untimely, uh, well, untimely execution after <laughs> he uh, killed somebody who's going to supposedly turn him in um, oh. for crimes he was committing, right? It's a family trade here. I was going to um, say, this is a great, great family tree so far. Yeah, I'm telling you, man. <laughs> We're hey, establishing. At, least they're, at least they're on brand, right? They're staying on brand. <laughs> yeah. Because also, Patty's brother was executed for horse stealing later. So, yeah, the family's really on brand. Um, <sighs> wow. But so, imagine this. Poor Miss Hanley, right? 
Um, she's lost her husband. She's got a house full of sons and daughters that she needs to now take care of. And so what she did was she turned a house into a hostel. And what they said was essentially that it was a house uh, for people who were coming up to get away from the warm southern um, the warm southern weather, but also a house of pleasure. I see. So, so it it served both roles, at least according to the the version of the history that's probably most solid. I I had read that she had done. Uh, Patty had attempted to do uh, some brothel type work, uh, but her personality kind of didn't fit. Uh, she was a bit too surly. Uh, I think I read somewhere that she yeah, had like a she, sour disposition. She didn't like. She didn't want to do the sex well, work. She was. She was. She was witty. She was a smart ass. She was, yeah. I, yeah. All the historical records suggest that she probably would have been really good at running a brothel. Not so right. Much. Well, that was the thing. She, she had that aspiration. I think to be a madam, but well, I think you have to kind of work your way up. The yeah, but chain, but I think you know? her mom was kind of doing that. Her yeah, mom was kind of doing that because what her mom was doing is, as wealthy men came to the house, she would try to convince them to marry her daughters. Ah, and the uh, as the story goes, Jesse Cannon, a Delaware wheel right, and those are the people who make or repair wooden wheels, comes up uh, to visit the area, gets sick, and is bedridden. So he, she, Mrs. Hanley has Patty take care of him every day. And supposedly the, what they said about Mrs. Hanley, I love this quote, she, that she exercised over the minds of men, um, convinced him to marry, uh, I love that quote, uh, mm-hmm. marry Patty and take her down to Delaware. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if if you're sort of thinking of like the, the origin of this, it's sort of like a little bit of a shotgun forced marriage. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but willingly goes, wants to go with him. Patty moves down to Delaware, Maryland border to essentially Delaware. Her husband, Jesse starts what was known as the Cannon Ferry, which still runs today. It's called the Woodland Ferry. They've, changed the name because they thought it was bad branding to have it named after a serial killer. Um, <clears throat> I mean, yeah. I guess. Here or there. I mean, like, right, exactly. <laughs> um, right. So they go back to Delaware. They have at least one daughter. They're believed to have, believed to have had two more children, right? Right. But then, so the way they describe Jesse, agreeable dude, large, attractive man, uh, really loved her wit, the fact that she was charismatic, that she danced, that she was into music. Um, but then, you know, so they establish, uh, they establish the fairy, but then Jesse does, right? Yeah. And so what the neighbors report is that Jesse and Patty had started to fight each other and Jesse's health then rapidly declined. Yes. Right? Mm-hmm. They, and the neighbors literally said that he died of grief due to the relationship <laughs> falling apart. But years Patty. later, to a priest, Patty would confess to have poisoned him. Yeah, yeah. Patty went on a bit of a confession spree, which, yeah, we'll we'll get to in the end there. But I find that that there are a lot of figures that we see throughout history and crime, true crime and, and whatnot that love to hear themselves talk. And, you know, so once they start to get in that sort of mythologizing self narrative kind of thing, H.H. H. Holmes was known to, which is why you don't want to believe many historical accounts of what H.H. H. Holmes did, because most of it came from his own mouth. Yes. But um, now I wanted to ask you too your, your sources that you uh, read for this, um, to uh the entailed hat uh mm-hmm. was one it's a fictional account of it by a guy yeah. named Hal Roth yeah. yeah there are a few and so finding finding details on Patty is a interesting uh dive it does require to really get into some actual hard book reading uh from what it sounds like because yeah the, the best online thing. accounts kind of vary you know yeah the best um yes 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 there, I mean, part of the problem is that the story became prominent in, uh, 
you know, it became prominent through a pamphlet that was written where they didn't use the real names. Like they called Patty Lucretia Cannon. They called Alonzo, I mean, Jesse Alonzo. But it was a very, um, you know, somewhat hyperbolic, maybe not as hyperbolic as people uh, thought. But there is a second uh, book that's really key. It's sort of like the gold standard for Patty Cannon research. And it's called The Monster's Handsome Face. Yeah. And it's because people said that Patty had a um, uh, handsome, handsome the, face. The paintings of her out there are, there are a couple that I've seen that they are depictions of her that are from these fictional accounts. They're a little creepy. There aren't any real portraits of her uh, that we were able to uncover um, quite, but the handsome description was the one that I kept seeing pop up that she, you know, she wasn't exactly like a, she didn't look like a monster, but she, you know, I, I, I often wonder like who would play her in a movie <laughs> I've been, as I've been doing the the research on this. But anyway, um, the, what I find interesting too, is that a lot of these uh, historical accounts being fiction, it sort of reminds me if we're thinking of a contemporary equivalent, people were writing about crimes back then, sort of the way uh, like Penny Dreadfuls or uh, mm -hmm. some of these yep. blown up accounts. And it's almost like watching these days, like a investigation discovery uh, kind of true crime show with a lot of bad reenactments. That's sort of the, yeah. the modern day it, yeah. of what it, was available back then. They would write them. Yes, exactly. They would write them like the sort of half fictionalized documentaries that we do on true crime, sort of like grabbing the, uh, you know, most salacious details, the best mm -hmm. rumors. So, but yeah. in recent years, a number of historians have really tried to like slice as much as they can, um, you know, between the, the sort of fact and, and fiction of it. Um, yeah. but, but one of the things that happens after the, um, the, untimely death of Patty's husband. You alluded to this before we talked to you about it before. Uh, one of the daughters marries a man named H Henry Beerton. Mm -hmm. um, and he was supposedly the one who introduced them. Although some accounts suggest Patty was already doing it before him to the illegal slave trading. Yes. Um, so, so there there's here or there. Um, which one was responsible for sort of starting it, but it's very clear that Beerton and Patty are working together um, in slave trading by the time her daughter has the, um, uh, the, um, the, uh, by, by the time her daughter's first marriage has happened. And, you know, one of the real interesting things that I spent time researching Allison was this idea of like, was it really weird for a woman to be involved in the illegal slave trade? And what I found was that the answer was no. Um, Richard Bell, who's a historian, had made the point that the illegal slave trade after after 1808 and the ban on uh, the importation of slaves gave women a real opportunity to sort of leverage familial and other relationships. Um, you know, with, uh, with sort of like uh, all sorts of people to sort of break out on their own and have some independence and control as men were doing other jobs uh, right. that were more more official. So you what you find during this period, and we were talking about Marie Delphine. Uh, oh, Madame LaLaurie. Yeah, yeah. Madame LaLaurie. You know, a lot of women during the time were interacting a lot with slaves, whether it was from the illegal slave trade or it was like actually managing the slaves. And, you know, you can tell the, her story, but she was essentially a New Orleans socialite who was a serial killer. Yes. Who tortured and murdered a ton, unknown number of slaves in her house. But, you know, people people called Patty the, the, the Northern version of her, although I think it might be backwards. I think that, yeah. <laughs> and you know, it's really sad. This is kind of a messed up way to put it, but I think too, maybe part of this is that when you're talking about like, uh, when you look at the time, like the social hierarchy of the time, 
I think women found a foothold in doing stuff like this to slaves because it was almost like women could finally be like, wow, there's somebody actually below me on the social ladder that I can abuse. And, and then it just becomes this sort of like, I don't know, I think there might have been a little bit of something like that going on where there's certain type of powerful, rich women, just like men who find that, hey, I can get my my jollies here hurting other people. If you're already inclined to being a violent, murderous criminal type, mm -hmm. um, it's it's just really funny. Uh, like, yeah, women finally had a chance to be the the murdering people, the the murdering violent criminals that their husbands were. Yeah, <laughs> so, right. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of it's messed like, up, but well, it's it, like the know? same thing that you know during World War II, is all the men went off to war, it opened up jobs and factories for women. Same thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> just serial killer style, but the. <laughs> right. But but the thing about it is, uh, and I see we have a good question about where the bodies ended up, and we'll definitely get to that. But, um, you know, one of the things that happens, too, during this point, I'm glad you brought this up, is that there's also a gender bias at play in the sense that just like in New Orleans, you know, in New Orleans, the only reason she got caught was because mm -hmm. her house went on fire and then the fire marshals came mm -hmm. and found a 70-year-old black woman tied to a stove. To the stove, right? yeah. Who then pointed them to where all the bodies were in the attic. She just basically said, people go up to the attic and never come back. And yeah, there was a back. really, um, really interesting recent series on her on last podcast on the left uh, that I uh, recommend if you want a good background on on okay. Madame LaLaurie. Um, but yeah, it's... Uh, it's interesting that we call her, people think of the Madame, Madame LaLaurie first. She, but you're absolutely right. I do wonder if it was, yeah. you know, it had it well, the other the, way around. The rumors about her were going on forever. And the rumors about Patty were not going on forever. And there is historical documentation that basically says that there are times where Patty was not prosecuted, no lo prosecute, um, because <laughs> of her gender. Right. Because they didn't either didn't believe it or they didn't want to do the prosecution. Unclear on which one it was. So basically, you have those rumors going around. It's 1811, and Henry Beerton is arrested mm -hmm. and starts serving a prison sentence for kidnapping probably white people's slaves. Right. So he escapes from jail in Georgetown, Delaware, which is like the one of the the county capitals. After his uh, escape, he reunites with Patty, and they launch this uh, um, plan to sort of ambush this slave trader named Rigel, who is yeah. uh, who's who is staying. And this is one of Patty's favorite things to do. She would like wine because she was charismatic. She would wine and dine people, fill them with food, ask them all sorts of questions, get them laughing and joking, find out whether they had money, slaves, or what their setup was. And with the original situation, they essentially let him leave, kept him there, gave him more free drinks, more free drinks, let him leave. One group, along with Patty, went ahead of him, knocked down a tree to block them. Another group went uh, between them, right? Uh, and 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 basically tried to kill them. They did a terrible yeah. job, horrendous they're, job. They're they killed one guy. Yeah. Two got away. At this point, they're not great. They get better. Um, yeah. But 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 what eventually happens is Beerton is caught, and he ultimately will be executed at, uh, later down this down the road. But what that does is. After he's caught, that forces Patty to really move out on her own. Mm -hmm. And you and, and so one of the things you then see happen is she starts to build um her own sort of independent gang. And a key part of that is Joe Johnson. Yeah. So when we were looking at the map, if you go here, you can see right here on the Border of Sussex County, um, and I think, is it Carolyn County or is it Dorchester? I forget which one. Um, uh, you have Patty's house in Reliance, Maryland. Literally right across is Joe Johnson's tavern. Yeah. They would, they would keep the slaves or the free blacks that they captured primarily at Patty's house, in her attic, in her cellar. 
they stopped using the cellar once it was filled with too many bodies that from people that she had killed, but the attic and then the rollover space was Joe Johnson's tavern. Now the tavern's main purpose was to sort of wine and dine the slave traders to try and ambush them, but its attic was also used to store slaves. Because when you're talking about three to 10,000 slaves over a 20 year period, you are running a factory. You were running right. a factory. So they are in Patty's house, in Joe's house, and then they would frog march them from Joe Johnson's house or from Patty's house down to what's in the middle of the map in front of us, which is the location of Cannons Ferry, now Woodland Ferry, and they would take them down the Nanticoke River out to the Chesapeake Bay. And one of the things that they would do is they'd have to frog march them all day, right? So what do you do with the slaves that you've left before the ship has a, has gone down the ferry? There was an island outside of where the ferry was, and they would tie the, the, the free Black slaves, whoever they captured, to the trees there. And that's when they would do their survey. And their survey was figuring out, is this person sellable? Is this uh, person going to be problematic somehow? And according to the history, if they found that they would be problematic on some level, they would either throw them in the river or kill them and put them in a building called Cannon Hall that was there. Mm. At, the, at the same time, Patty also uh, could not stand the sound of children crying. And so one of the real famous pictures of of her that was in that magazine, which I think I, do I have it up here? I don't think I have it here, but it's on the cover, is of her holding a black child in front of a fire. Well, yeah. apparently that child had been screaming um, and she grabbed the child, she walked it to the fireplace, scorched the child in front of the fire. It was a mortal wound yeah. to right. the point where it burned her own hand. Wow. And then buried that child in the cellar. And that wasn't the only child that she killed. Yeah, because they found the several. That she killed over crying. Yeah, they found a, a couple of dead children on her property. See, see what um, I'm saying? There's more than profit going on. Here. Oh, absolutely. She she just seemed like someone who was an opportunistic killer. Uh, you know, if she could kill someone, she would kill them. Um, if they inconvenienced her, unless they could make her money. That was the only mm -hmm. real path. Um, now, I wanted to uh, ask, now, we, I mentioned the War of 1812 sort of being a factor in this earlier, and I see it here in the notes as well. Um, so we're not going to discuss the entire War of 1812, obviously, but um, the conditions of that war were such that the Americans and our uh, Native allies basically went back to battle against Great Britain. Um and their native allies. And their native oh, allies. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um it was it was a, a very interesting uh conflict. But um but the it what it essentially did was it opened up even more of a pathway, right? Um for Patty and her gang to uh get the um the free blacks and the slaves down to South down to the Carolinas in the deep South. Is that correct? Yeah. And a big part of it, if you think about it, it's their geography, right? During the war of 1812, if we jump back and take a look at, let's say this slide, uh, if you look at the Delmarva Peninsula and if you, you know, at the Virginia part that's sticking out, the British would send ships up the Chesapeake Bay. They would stop those ships and require everyone to prove they were American. An American citizen. Yes. If you were a slave or you were someone who was not American citizen, they would free you. And this is a part of their harassment. Yeah. But they stopped at the mouth of the Nanticoke River. So that allowed Patty's group to bring people down by, um, by the river, either go through the bay or break further down on the peninsula or cross over into Maryland. So that river and the fact that the British did not go up the river also gave her a competitive market advantage. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And and speaking of that market, I was really fascinated by the economics 
of the situation because when when they banned the import of uh, Africans uh, for slavery, um, the remainder what what tends to happen obviously whenever you ban an import is it makes what's here go up in in value starts costing more um and so the price of a slave back then was a thousand dollars in that currency worth about twenty two thousand five hundred dollars today that's yeah. still kind of disgusting in terms of like that's all a human life is worth is twenty two thousand five hundred dollars um Ugh, anyway, um, but uh, I'd pay people twenty two thousand five hundred dollars to stay away from me. Yeah, there, place, is, but... there is that. <laughs> there is that. But I find it really interesting, though, because there were other states, right, that hadn't that weren't weren't they kind of like like South Carolina was still trying to bring people in. Um, yeah, um, there were um, other Hawaiian. states, right? So, yeah. so there were states that tried to break it, but you also have to remember the Louisiana Purchase, right? Oh, yes. So yes. New Orleans was exempted for a while from the ban on imports, the slaves. So they were still able to bring in slaves. It was done illegally. But you have, to, I think the thing to realize about the War of 1812, obviously this is going on illegally, quote unquote. That gave the British an opportunity to harass the Americans yeah. about it. They it allowed them to free slaves, right? But I think an important thing to look at it is if I'm Britain and I'm competing against a country that has enormous agricultural and other resources that has a free labor force, it's going to yeah. be harder to beat them. So if I can free that labor force see this was the thing that i was wondering and one thing i wanted to ask you during oh, you're wondering was, whether the british being were being noble am i being cynical here are that when i noticed that the great britain had abolished slavery in the same year i was like wait are they trying to offer competitive packages like who is your better uh leader here the queen or the king i'm sorry or well, look, i mean you have to look at it <laughs> like look at what's happening in haiti and the caribbean and other spots mm. like that right you essentially right. have in the caribbean slave revolts happening and people mm -hmm. are captured by those on islands yes and 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 the british start to have much less land that they can cultivate using slavery so slavery becomes less to their advantage Right, And it, it's highly to the Americans' advantage. So if you're competing with the Americans, there is a great advantage to slavery going out of favor. You're not going to beat them one for one anymore. Right. So, right. That is very yeah. interesting. Um, and so with all this going on, then, of course, at, and this, again, this happened, this is all taking place over about 20 years. Is that right? It was about mm -hmm. how active uh, Long Patty was active for. Um, so she was able to really uh, capitalize on on the market and the war and everything that was going on. And now with the War of 1812, was there any like active fighting like going on in the country or was the war mainly kind of well, out? Yeah, I mean, you know? so. No, 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 no. I mean, the war came to D.C. It came to D.C. Right. Okay, you're 18th, absolutely right. Yeah. You're right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is a war I have not studied as much in depth as like the revolution and the Civil War. So mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I've been trying to backfill a couple knowledge gaps on this one. Um, so as we've the, been White going, House, so. the White House was burned by the British. Yeah, that's right. The, going up the, the Potomac. The original mm -hmm. White House. That's right. It did yeah. burn uh, in the War of 1812. Um, so the reverse underground railroad uh, that they were doing, that was what stayed active for a long time. But they were doing other gang activities as well, right? Because, like you said, they were killing other uh, slave dealers. They were kidnapping people and bringing them south. But they were also getting them from Philadelphia, and that was that's who I want to wanted to kind New of bring Jersey, in New Jersey, yeah, because yeah. because you had mentioned um, Henry Barrington Barrington was uh, he was kidnapping other people's slaves, right? Yeah. He was yeah, yeah. he was going on to other people's plantations and stealing their slaves, which is incredibly or their dangerous. homes if it wasn't a, yeah. Yeah, yeah right, and not just kidnapping free people, but I mean that 
Um, and then, and not just robbing slave traders who were transporting slaves, but also just going onto the plantations and taking slaves. Um, and you see but, less of that in the history of, as the gang evolves, they start to get out yeah. of the business of, or the gang itself, once Joe Johnson and Patty are running it, are not. No longer doing that. And what's interesting, too, is I had read that they also utilized uh, within their gang black members or members of mixed race oh, as yeah. sort of decoys. Like yeah, if you yeah. want to make if you want to put somebody you're trying to kidnap at ease and you have black people in your gang, then they're going to not maybe not feel like they're as much in danger. But that was part There's, of. The, yeah. The so that's definitely a part of it. Right. Like you're trying to lure people into kidnapping. It helps to have people who can tell you of great jobs or opportunities or whatever it is. But it also serves another purpose, just like with the murder of Emmett Till in um, in Mississippi in right. the 1950s is you you have built in fall guys right there. Too. There right. were two black men who were a part of that group that went with them. It's it, it's 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 historically you will see that the slave traders inevitably had some black servants or whatever you want to call them right. somehow right. involved in their work. It served many utilities. And what they would do, um, and this is part of what led to her downfall and um, her capture, is that, you know... <laughs> One of the one of the guys who worked for her, um, and I'm trying to remember which of the two it was. I think it was Cyrus. Uh, Cyrus. Uh, Cyrus. I can't think of Cyrus's name. But one of the one of the black men who worked for her would go to Philadelphia, would charm both women and men, and would attempt to get them to come to jobs in other places or spots where they essentially would get kidnapped. And so that was essentially um, the way that eventually Philadelphia gets involved in the case. But there were others who would travel across Delaware and do similar things. There were others who would do similar things in New Jersey. So this group, you know, Western Maryland, Western Pennsylvania, very expansive. Um, they had a very expansive reach. And ultimately, that reach into the northern states and the ethics of some people in the deep south are what lead to their downfall. Right. Yeah. Right. It's it's uh, just incredible um, what they uh, were able to get away with. You know, I was going through a lot of the sort of uh, gang activities that you had uh, uh you know, written down, you'd mentioned the, the child mm -hmm. in the fireplace. And, um, and then there were travelers that would come to the tavern. Um, I think you mentioned one that she had uh, stabbed him in the heart with a dagger. Um, and other people had walked into the house during the killing and she caught up with them and threw him on a table that had dishes on it, covered him in the tablecloth and thrust him into a chest in the room, then called accomplices who robbed him and took his body on a small boat into the river. So yep. this is just, but one, night hanging Example. out with patty cannon this is what yeah. happens <laughs> yeah there was um one that she allowed to board a slave trader board in her house and mm -hmm. there was a secret passage they came up and they clubbed him she clubbed him um yeah. there's another example of somebody who was at the tavern another mm -hmm. slave trader who was at the tavern and they seated him by a window Mm -hmm. So someone could come from the back of the window and stab him there. So, you know, like people talk about like mere presence, right? Like, yeah. When they're like 30 or 40 people disappearing and that all seems to be around you. Uh, yeah. And, yeah, you know, it becomes it's a little more than mere presence is, you know, uh, the sheer body count uh, of killers from, <laughs> from earlier eras is astounding. I think mostly because um, it was harder to, uh, get caught probably um, mm -hmm. back in those days. So people could just do a lot more killing before. Um, and, you know, and this is of course, well before we even knew the term serial killer was a thing. Um, but it's uh, utterly fascinating to me that this woman had a house full of bodies and, um, and you just look at this sheer body count aside from all the kidnapping that she did um, responsible for the death of 
probably over 10,000 people in indirectly or directly. Disapp- yeah, you know, disappearance. disappearance. I mean, a lot of these people death. that were sold. Now, there were Put people that were recovered. And I and I yes. do want to uh, bring that up because there were people that she sold down the river, literally, um, that did get recovered. And that was thanks in large part to the mayor. Of, of Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Yeah. 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 So our, our friend Mike Ely, Just Legal History. Hey, Mike. Check it out if you have not seen yes. it. Yes. He's got and I gotta YouTube get it. Yeah. Channel. I'm on an episode. Jason's on an episode. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Brett. Yep. Brett. The prosecutor's right. on an episode. He's got lots of really good guests. But he asked, where did he put the bodies? So when people ask me that question, where did she put the bodies? I have like one story that can give you all of the many examples. So there was this black boy who worked for her in the house, 15-year-old black boy. She became very suspicious that he was going to rat her out and escape at some point. So he had been like a waiter and a servant in the house. um, And she really became... Or he, the 15-year-old, appeared to become really, really uncomfortable once she burned that child to death that I was yeah. talking about before. So she became worried about him. So the gang basically went after him, beat him with a large shovel, right? Mm-hmm. Then Patty took him alive, locked him in the cellar where she kept most of the dead bodies before they were transported out, Um it also had skeletons of children that she had murdered down there, left him there for two days and two nights with no food and water. Um, then she came down and she asked him, she wanted to check to see if he was still alive, brought him a little bit of food, then asked him whether he'd inform on her. He pointed out all the other stuff and said, of course he would. And then she took a stone, beat him to death, buried him in the garden. So the answer to your question is in the, in the cellar itself, skeletons in the garden out back uh there were bodies and then another field there were bodies in you know when she ultimately gets arrested later in the story there were 20 i think 21 people Mm -hmm. uh chained up in the tavern ready for transport and then there were several uh many 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 bodies and a couple of people at her house yeah anyway yeah I just um, wanted to get that. And and yes, if you're curious uh, about how it smelled, it was probably terrible. <laughs> I mean, you know, you think about these houses full of bodies and, and whatnot. I think that there are people that just, um, I think if you're into killing that much, I don't, I don't know that you necessarily notice or care. Uh, maybe you like it. Um, maybe you just like I'll, being. I'll let you know when I start my next career. <laughs> I, I, for one, would like to keep it clean, you know? Um, but the there were it, it just feels like an almost hopeless kind of situation, right? Because people, her victims are still largely not considered real victims at this point in time. These are these yeah. are slaves or black people that don't matter to the you know the white population. So nobody's going to take it seriously. This is how people have gotten away with serial murder for millennia. Um, yeah. Going Targeting after publishers. people, you know, sex workers, nobody cares about them either, right? So uh countless but times something history, something you know? was changing though. Yes, you have to, you know, like as she much as wrong people, you do something well, long enough, you're gonna piss off enough people or the wrong person. Although also some of it is the economic incentives, right? Mm-hmm. So something mm-hmm. was changing with the the economics as much as I like to beat up America, because I really do. Uh, if you if you want to get into a boxing match with me, sit, tell me about this great country that we live in. I want mean, to I want to well, get in that fight too. Man. Let's do it. Yeah, let's. <laughs> we'll, yeah, we can duke it out. So, um, but but part of what was changing, right? As you have more free blacks in the north, and slavery is no longer a part of what's happening in the north, they start becoming vital parts to the industrial economy. So, kidnapping free blacks from a state like maryland or a state like delaware is probably pretty safe right kidnapping them from a city like philadelphia where they're beginning to be seen a little bit more like citizens yes is pretty dangerous yeah so, and mayor yeah. joseph wilson he he was getting of philadelphia yeah. of philadelphia he was getting damn tired mm-hmm. of people from his city of brotherly love getting kidnapped yep 
And it's really interesting to hear about a mayor, a city mayor, reaching well beyond the borders, not only of a city, but his several states uh, to reach his hand as far down as, you know, Louisiana or Alabama or Mississippi to uh, get his people back. Yeah, and- he basically had three key nemesis. Mayor Joseph Wilson of Philadelphia, mm-hmm. John Clayton, who is in the U.S. House of Representatives. He represented Delaware. He was later toward the end of Patty's run. He was the Delaware Secretary of State. Um, he was sent to the Senate after. Uh, and he was one person who had been fighting and fighting and fighting, um, yes. fighting to uh, to take care of it. He was a you know prominent uh close associate of the soon to be president Taylor. Um, And then the best part of the story to me, I, I, the Philadelphia part's great, but it's actually an attorney and a slave owner from Mississippi that are the key to breaking the case. Yes. John Henderson correct um yeah an attorney for hamilton uh and later a u.s senator from mississippi uh this according to your notes that are wonderful uh said that if the statements of uh his blacks provided accurate they should be published so um the people of philadelphia the quote colored people of philadelphia Mm -hmm. could be guarded against similar uh outrages um and convinced he was convinced of johnson's guilt um do you want and, me to give you a but, little background on how he got involved in it? I can yeah, give you that that'd be quick. Great. Yeah, so in a town called uh, Rocky Spring, Mississippi, um, there were three boys, three black yes. boys, and two women who were offered for sale. One of the boys told the man, the slave owner, John Hamilton, that they weren't slaves, but they'd actually been stolen from Philadelphia. So Hamilton... Uh, sent for a Mississippi Justice of the Peace who questioned the people who brought them down. The people who brought them down, uh, or the, were, were, were there were several people, but one of them was Ebenezer Johnson, who was related to Joe Johnson. Mm. He produced a bill of sale for the Blacks and agreed to let them remain with Hamilton until the backgrounds were verified. Enter John Henderson, who's Hamilton's lawyer, Meanwhile, Johnson, Ebenezer Johnson, disappears. Well, (laughs) you eventually find out that you're dealing with, um, they ultimately find out that you're dealing with people who are captured from Philadelphia. Later, they will find people captured from Delaware who were sold in Alabama, people captured from, and these were children, these were women, these were men in an an assortment of different people. But really what spurred it was John Henderson, the attorney for Hamilton, reaches out to Mayor Wilson of Philadelphia and says, hey, we've got this problem down here of free Blacks who are being offered up uh, for sale. And every incentive in the world that John Henderson and his client had would have been to be silent and just mm-hmm. let it happen in the background. But they wanted to adhere to the raw law um, yeah. or had some kind of moral conviction related to it. Um, you know, but basically they, they Henderson gives them the advice to investigate it. Um, they had no idea in that moment that they were unraveling. And, you know, people talk about how it just starts with one clue. They had no idea they were unraveling one of the biggest kidnapping uh, organizations in American history. And so Wilson follows his advice, which eventually connects him with Delaware's attorney general, James Rogers, and also John Clayton, who in the attorney general of Delaware had tried previously um, to bring Patty to justice because Patty had been arrested um, yeah. previously with Joe Johnson and she had been released right. he was actually punished at the pillory and if you guys have ever seen the pillory it's like the thing where your head goes through the wood and your hands go through on the other side the part that they leave out is that they nail your ears to the yes part. the little soft so, part of your ears 
<laughs> yeah, so Joe, like you can still see it in the uh, newspaper where Joe was put against the pillory. And this mm-hmm. was over a kidnapping. Put against the pillory from like 10 to 4 on a day. Patty was initially charged with it, but the charges were dropped against yes. her and others. So they're kind of on to her, right? Like they are on to her. But it really takes this guy, this slave owner with some kind of conscience in Mississippi, his attorney, and the mayor of Philadelphia to come together to finally get the resources that the Delaware Attorney General needs to 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 bring this to justice. So at the time she gets arrested, we're at 1821 is when she gets arrested with Johnson. Johnson is the only one. Um, punished in 1824 so they think at this point johnson's now out of the business right Right. but in 1824 a black woman named hannah mccoy coily files a petition for freedom in Mm. maryland against johnson and another man so they're like why does this person have a free black person so then in 1826 johnson fakes leaving the area right (laughs) <laughs> but is still active. And so really it's the period of 1826 to 1829 mm-hmm. where you Johnson is allegedly not there. Patty's in semi-retirement. There are all these stories and there are these little newspaper clippings about her going to different Maryland homes where she's like entertaining the hosts, the hostesses, telling gossip, amusing stories. You know, she's supposedly in semi-retirement. But eventually they find a number of records that suggest that uh, they are still killing blacks. They're still uh, moving slaves. And so, but what really causes it to unravel are a couple of, a couple of different things. One of which was one of the people who were in Mississippi, who was actually free, was a woman from Elkton, Maryland. A black woman who had, which is on the eastern shore, closer to the, closer to the bay, and that caused the Maryland authorities to kind of go mm, a little bit. So you have all these forces working against her, and rumors spreading in the neighborhood. And so, so sort of the final thing is these forces are coming together. Is and I love this, and you guys should take this at PSA if you think your uh, neighbor has dead bodies in their house or something like that. <laughs> The neighbors put together a group, right? And they, it was it was they, next door. It was yes. old timey next door. <laughs> the next door. And they pretend that they want to buy a part of the property and they sneak on the property and they basically convince one of her servants who's black and they say they'll protect her if they let her down in the cellar and they let her down in the cellar and that ultimately leads to Patty's Oh, they, oh my God. Wow. Yeah. Because then they were able to get a, you see uh, something, say something. A sheriff came out with a warrant and had about a dozen armed men. And and, this is, uh, speaking of border, this is so crazy that it's like the Maryland sheriffs are on the Delaware property. The Delaware sheriffs are hitting the Maryland property. Nobody knows what's going on. It's a jurisdictional nightmare. I mean, really. And it still Mm -hmm. can be in that part of the country, I think, especially if you just think, oh, this was in D.C. D.C. is not a state. What are you doing? Um, But I I mean, I'm going now if I need someone to disappear. (laughs) Right, right. But, you know, what's interesting is that amid all of this, they find all these people, they find all these bodies. She was only charged with four murders at the yes. at the end of it. And so, I mean, really in our system, I mean, one will usually get you put away for life or or, or hanged um, in this in this day and age uh, that we're talking about. But um, but she and her in the gang were all tried and convicted and sentenced to execution um but uh patty patty didn't go out quite no, quite so simply did no, she because patty went out like in the same murdering way that she came in yeah um she basically started poisoning herself that's what the historians believe and she started poisoning herself and like the way they started noticing something was wrong like chunks of her hair were coming off and then she started tearing her clothes off and they had to replace them. And then she started biting anyone she could reach. 
And yeah. then she would get calm and be fine for a little while and become more composed. And in those composed moments, she started expressing remorse, right? Yeah. And then and then she would go on one of her rages of madness again because she was probably poisoning herself again. And and then back to remorse. In one of those remorse moments, she asked for a priest. And she confesses to 11 murders by her own hand and gives mm-hmm. accounts of them and says she's been the accessory to dozens of other murders, including the murder of one of her children um, by uh, who was three days old. Yeah. Uh, by And then the poisoning of her husband and um, killing two of her wealthy neighbors. Yeah. The account suggests that the actual number is 24 or more, a minimum of 24, possibly more, um, by by Patty's own hand, not to include her accessories. Right. Because, yeah, if you if you put in the accessories, I'm telling you, I'm getting some uh, people with some pretty heavy body counts on this show. We have Bell Gunnis, who had up to 40, it was believed, and then. Um, the Russian guy, Vasily Blokin, had 7,000 at least, and now her, um, Patty Cannon. So uh, just to show, I think, how um, it only takes one person in a lot of cases to ruin a lot of lives, a whole lot of lives. Jill, you are correct. This is gross. Yeah. Um, And Lily, you are correct. She was loca and evil. And uh, Lily wanted to know, uh, does she have any children uh, with any of the slaves or, you know, I don't know that we could know that that, possibly. but Not that we know that she had children with a slave. She did have her own children. And that's actually an interesting point that uh, local rumors that were actually, you know, in the other version of the story, the non-Canada version of the story, the local version is that she was uh part mulatto herself yes um or part native herself now there's some people who believe that those stories were made up to disassociate um disassociate uh her from them but the intermixing of races in the south as you can imagine particularly as you got uh into areas like Delaware and Maryland was quite high. So like, I don't think you can rule out the idea that there may have been some self-loathing thing going on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Um, And so she, they don't know exactly where her body was. Now you have, um, uh, they think that they found her skull, but we're not 100% on that. Yeah. Yeah. So there are two versions of her skull. Um, These are, these are the, most prominent one, the ones that were in the, they used to take it out for Halloween in the, at the, at the Delaware archives. So, um, but in the, the, the picture on the right of the lady holding the skull and looking into it is, um, is uh, uh, from it, when it was exhibited, someone sanely passed a law in Delaware that said you could not um, uh, display human remains uh uh, in the museum, oh. so eventually this skull got sent to the Smithsonian. One of the funny stories uh, is that a historian, I think it was in the nineties or something like that. I may have the dates wrong, but came in asking about Patty Cannon and was talking to the archivist about it, and who was the archives director. And he was like, "Oh, I have her skull right in here," and then just walked over to the shelf in his uh, office, pulled out that little box, and then. There was Patty's skull. You know, there, yeah, there have been a lot of laws passed about what um, various institutions can do with human remains. Like there are books that are bound in human skin that the Harvard Medical School Library has um, in their collections. And there's a lot of problems surrounding having those things on hand. So that doesn't surprise me. Um, Do we have any um, future horror writers in the chat? Because Allison and I have a great horror book <laughs> idea for you because if you go back here to oh yeah this picture is joe johnson's tavern where they would like wine dine and stuff slaves well apparently there is a house now built on the foundation of it 
just so a normal looking house are, did not watch poltergeist and there is a great horror movie they well, they need to remake the conjuring i'm telling you they need to remake it get those get those charlatan um uh uh that couple who's named the warrens get them out of that we need to put reset it and put it on this property right here right. <laughs> because honestly if there is any piece of haunted land in this country it's gonna be right on that patch um, right I would I would think um, it, it is interesting to see, though, that at least they're putting some um, signage up. They're acknowledging yep. the history here in some yep. way, um, because this story, which what I kept noticing over and over again as I was studying it, is that there's just not a lot out there. And um, and what you have dug up for this episode, um, hopefully will paint a much broader picture even going onto youtube i was telling jason i'm like we're gonna have to like make this video public beyond this after this episode goes live as a podcast because there's just no content out there about patty cannon um yeah. really um well, other than you know I, and it's really interesting to me too when we talk about things like um the um uh, you know like we have these conversations about like, are there women serial killers or are there many, or are there, there are many notorious ones. If we talk about like, you know, the motives behind things, I think we tend to flatten and simplify them. Right. right. You know, did Patty kill over money or was it about independence or was it about what happened to her as a child? Or is it just because like, she was a psychopath or she was very yeah. excitable, whatever it is. It's usually a wild mix of things. Yeah. And I think the thing that you have to look at, because I tend to come of mind that Patty was a serial killer first mm -hmm. and not a slave trader first. Right. Slave trading was a way to make money, get power. She's a psychopath. It worked for her. Serial killing was also her business that these times in history where we have turmoil, look at something like the war in Ukraine right now or yeah. Hurricane Katrina in Florida, that is wide open ground for people, even if they're not serial killers, who want to do harm to other people. Like right. when we do not um, take care of each other or take care of uh, laws, and you can still see places like this now, inner cities, um, native, like the Navajo reservation during COVID, those are wide open opportunities for people who want to do harm, whether it's killing right. or something else to do that harm. And I think there's an important lesson for us that persists into society today when we turn the blind eye, um, to certain groups or populations or, yes. or, or look at some of these real politics things that we're doing in other countries that we turn the blind eye, we're opening the door. I, I doubt there's many people, although there are probably some, who would listen to what they heard in this episode today and not find this horrendous. Right. But I bet if we did a real inventory, there's something that we're enabling or not fighting, just like happened in Rwanda or Bosnia or in Ukraine during the war. Or what's that, happening in Haiti right now. Or what's happening in Haiti speak. right now. Mm -hmm. Is it that is contributing yes. to the exact same things that your grandkids or your great grandkids, when they're getting this uh, podcast thing on a chip in their brain, are going to be thinking <laughs> are horrendous. Yeah. hundred years from now. So yeah. Anyway. And, and, and also I, I found, you know, looking back uh, and, and reading about these horrors that I'm reading on, every topic that I'm covering on this show is uh, I find myself playing the Mr. Rogers looking for the helpers uh, person because I'm like, all right, where's, where's my hero? Is there a hero anywhere in this narrative? Sometimes there is often there is not. Um, I loved, I got some reassurance, I think from the heroes in this particular story, because my God, there were so many who needed somebody. Um, and this right here shows like you said, that importance, I think, of us looking um, out for one another uh, and holding together that social net and, provi and providing the basics for one another. So maybe we don't feel the need to rob and steal and kill uh, to survive um, even uh, and trying to keep this sort of um, 
or or how about we just don't treat people like property? I think that would also be <laughs> perhaps be a good lesson. Great moral yeah. of the story. Um, but uh, is that does that wrap it up for you, Jason? I mean, I know we had a lot of material here and um, canon could go on forever for me. Yeah. But um the I think I think in taking and looking back at some of these historical examples, uh, you know, it's fascinating. And that's one of the things I love about your podcast. But I would just encourage everyone to have a really broad aperture and mm -hmm. recognize that there are analogous things happening so today, much. whether it's in Russia or Canada or Mexico. It's all or, over the world. And if you think a border is going to prevent the chaos in one place from spilling over into another place. Uh, that's not going to happen. And history has borne and my, that. my, my border is the atmosphere. That, yes. That little globe. The is border, border is exactly mm -hmm. between here and space. That is our and, border. Until they're aliens and I will bring them in our border. <laughs> <laughs> well, until we find them or they find us. Although, you know, I was listening to this really funny thing, this interview, um, and the guy was like, okay, if aliens did find us, why would they stop? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I liked uh, Michio Kaku as one of my favorite astrophysicists and uh, the way when he talks about uh, sometimes about how other uh, civilizations would view us anyway. Uh, a lot of the prevailing theory is that they would just view us the way we view ants uh, in the sense that you just walk on them or by them. You don't really unless they're getting into your stuff. You just don't yeah. really think about them. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's. Um, I hope to welcome every opportunity to examine history and find the parallels. That's why I love to do that zeitgeist because it's like things that were happening then affecting what's happened in the broader scope often give you a, a slice of like, why, why is this happening here in the, in the closer up? So um, I want to do that with every episode. And I hope that if you liked today's episode, that you will be back for more that Jason will come back for more guests, uh, guest spots and uh, cause I just love this discussion and I love the, the knowledge that you have to share on this topic has been hugely valuable to me. And I know it'll be very valuable to my listeners. And, you know, while you're waiting for the next episode, I hope that you will consider joining the vintage villains, Patreon or join Jason's the silver linings handbook uh, or both or both. Is uh, it the either or thing? No, we're not in competition, man. We really should just, you know, open it up and combine it. Conglomerate. Yes. Um, but the that's prosecutor, the... vintage villain, ding dong, darkness, silver linings, handbook, Santa, maybe. Yeah, Santa, maybe. Patreon. I mean, you know, the get it the, all in one kingdom. package. <laughs> the kingdom is growing. Look out, Wondery. We're coming for you. Um, but, uh, but there's, um, that. But the Patreon is where you will get to stay up on more events like this, like live recordings. You can participate in the chats and have questions answered. Um, and there's also this discussion over on Facebook at the Vintage Villain Soiree, where, uh, of course, you can also uh, bring up new topics or post related things to what we're talking about here and any questions that you have. And of course, you can also leave ratings and reviews over on Apple and Spotify. Uh, and finally, go and check out Jason Blair's podcast, The Silver Linings Handbook. He is giving some of the best interviews that you'll find out there, period. If you love an interview podcast, seriously, where, that, where he'll talk to any variety of people and just get down into, you know, what really makes them tick. Uh, you have a gift for that, my friend. And I oh, think people you. need to go and check out your show. Um, and that's it. That's all I've got here uh, for this episode of Vintage Villains. But now it's time for you all to go on and make good history. And I'll see you next time in another century. <laughs> <laughs>